What's up everyone? Welcome to my channel. This is a channel that provides discussions with the latest findings, developments, and perspectives in psychedelic science in a manner that's accessible but not superficial at the same time. I'm the host. My name is Manesh Gurn. I'm a neuroscience PhD student with ongoing research related to psychedelics, among other things. So in this video, I'm actually going to focus more on neuroscience, on the brain, as opposed to psychedelics. Something we hear a lot in the media is about these brain networks, such as the default mode network and others. In this video, I'm going to provide an introductory overview of the seven main brain networks that neuroscientists usually refer to. All right, so let's dive right into it. So first, what is fMRI? So fMRI stands for Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging. It's basically a way that neuroscientists can measure our brain activity while we're awake and without opening up our skull. The principle that guides fMRI is the fact that when a brain region becomes active, it uses more oxygen. And interestingly, blood that contains oxygen versus blood that doesn't contain oxygen give off different magnetic signals. So basically what an fMRI does is it picks up these changes in magnetic signals which are an indirect measure of brain activity. And this is what gives rise to all these beautiful brain images we see in the media and elsewhere. Before I dive into brain networks, let's first talk about what a brain region is. So the brain itself is this extremely complex organ and it's comprised of somewhere around 100 billion brain cells or neurons, each connected to around a thousand other neurons, creating this insane amount of complexity. So in order to try to understand it, scientists have to break it down into different components and look at how they interact. And so there are a variety of ways to break the brain into different components. One of these is this concept of a brain region. And so how we can think of a brain region is a set of neurons, perhaps a couple million, which share certain cellular properties, share certain activity patterns, and also seem to carry out a coordinated function. And so over the years, there's been many ways proposed to separate the brain into sets of brain regions, with the number of brain regions varying from perhaps 100 to 1,000. And so we understand the brain as a collection of brain regions, which can more or less be differentiated from each other. And what's interesting, if we look at how these different brain regions correlate with each other, they seem to cluster into networks. So a network is simply a set of brain regions which have a tendency to correlate more with each other in their activity patterns than the rest of the brain. So basically we can understand a brain network as a set of brain regions that have a tendency to work together, often to perform some combined function. As this is a very general example, we can think of the visual network, which is a set of regions which all relate to visual processing, and each region will relate to a different aspect of visual processing, but it takes interactions between them all to combine to give rise to our experience of visual perception. And we can contrast with a network related to our attention or our sense of touch and so on. And it's important to recognize that at the end of the day, the complex processes that our brain carries out that allow us to think, perceive, and act in the world relate to the interactions between these different brain networks. So although they can be differentiated, they're always interacting with each other. All right, so in what follows, I'm gonna dive into what we can call the seven primary or canonical large-scale brain networks that fMRI brain scientists often refer to. This brain network scheme originated with a 2011 paper by a researcher named Thomas Yeo and his colleagues over at Harvard at the time. This paper has been cited over 3,000 times and kind of laid the framework that a lot of neuroscientists use to think about these things. So I'm gonna walk through each of these seven networks, starting with the more basic sensory processing related networks and ending with the default mode network, which is involved in the most abstract cognitive processes. So first is the visual network. So this is a network composed of regions found in our occipital lobe, kind of at the back of our head. And as the name suggests, they're involved in visual processing. And so light from the external world hits our eyes, hits our retina, and gets sent to the back of our brain to our visual network, and is processed by a set of regions in a kind of processing hierarchy. And on the basis of all this processing, it allows us to have this perception of an external world. And next is the somatomotor network. So this is a network that comprises two strips of the brain, which are in front of and behind what is called the central fissure. Basically, this fissure separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe, and the frontal aspect of this strip of cortex corresponds to motor cortex, whereas the rear or posterior part of this strip corresponds to somatosensory cortex. And as the name suggests, these regions mediate our sense of touch and also our ability to move our muscles, our motor commands. And what's interesting is certain aspects of our body where our sense of touch is more sensitive or in which we have more motor coordination take up more of this strip of cortex than others. This is often shown in terms of what's called the sensory homunculus, which basically sizes each body part based on the amount of cortex devoted to it. 
And next is what's called the salience network. And we could say that this network is involved in two primary functions. So the first, it integrates signals from our body, like feeling states and different sensations with our decision making and thinking. And second, this network also tags things in our external environment as worthy of our attention. This is kind of why it's called the salience network. It kind of tags things as being salient and automatically leads our attention to be driven to them. So for example, if we're watching the night sky and all of a sudden a meteor appears, our attention would automatically shift to that. And this automatic shift in attention, what researchers called stimulus-driven attention, can be said to be mediated by the salience network. And next is the dorsal attention network. This network kind of complements the salience network and mediates our ability to consciously or deliberately direct our attention to the external world. Regions within this network include regions that allow us to move our eyes and also regions that kind of mediate the processing of information related to the position of ourselves and objects in space. Another interesting thing about this network is that it seems to be in a competitive relationship with the default mode network. So as we'll see in a moment, the default mode network is involved in kind of internally directed cognitive processes that involve memory and involve thinking. So when the dorsal attention is more active, it's involving our focus in the external world and this usually leads the default mode network to deactivate. And conversely, when we're thinking about things in an internally directed way, the, the dorsal attention network becomes less active. So this seems to mediate this competition between external and internal attention. And next is the limbic network. So we can understand this network as integrating signals from evolutionarily older, more primitive emotional areas in our brain with our cortex. So basically it allows this emotional information to influence our thinking, our perception, and our behavior. Next is the frontoparietal control network. This network is essentially engaged whenever we're trying to think about something in a direct, deliberate way. Whenever we're trying to reason or problem solve, this network becomes online. And it kind of more specifically mediates our ability to flexibly and adaptively manipulate our thinking to solve a particular task or complete a particular goal. Scientists refer to this process as executive control or cognitive control or goal-directed thinking. As you might expect, this network has often been linked to intelligence, for example. An interesting fact about this network is that it could become connected to the dorsal attention network or default mode network. For example, when our attention is aimed outwards and we're trying to solve some problem that's in the external world, the frontal parietal control network connects to the dorsal attention network. And if we're trying to solve some problem internally, such as when we're trying to plan or project ourselves into the future, then the frontal parietal control network becomes connected with the default mode network. So essentially, we can think of it as this generalized network that allows us to reason and solve things in a directed way. And lastly is our favorite network, the default mode network. This network gets the most attention in the media, mainly because it's this fascinating, enigmatic network that carries out a lot of abstract functions that separate us from other animals and other primates. Functions that the default mode network can carry out include our ability to reason about the mental states or beliefs of others, self-related processing that differentiates ourselves from other people, our ability to remember the past and project ourselves into the future, our ability to daydream or mind wander, or even night dream, and essentially any aspect of our thinking, perception, or behavior that relies on either our memories of past experiences or our conceptual knowledge. So basically the default mode network mediates the most abstract processing that's actually most distinct from our basic sensory processes. And the default mode network is also the network that's perhaps the most connected to the rest of the brain. And therefore it plays an important role in mediating the interactions between other networks. All right, so those are the seven networks. I hope you enjoyed this quick dive into them. Always remember that all these networks, although they carry out more or less distinct functions, are always interacting with each other in very complex and dynamic ways to give rise to the fluid way in which we perceive, think about, and interact with the world. And these interactions, for example, are disrupted in different mental health conditions, can be radically altered by psychedelics, and really just change based on our experience and whatever we're doing. And with that, that's all I wanted to say. Definitely leave any questions below if there's anything you want me to go into in more detail. And if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button for more videos from me related to neuroscience and also psychedelics. And I'll see you soon.